All right, welcome back to the dome. And today I want to talk about uh, how all this stuff fits together, hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing for means specifically, although we do hypothesis tests for other things as well. But hypothesis test for means. I want to talk about uh, reducing everything to a few basic questions. So one, the research question down to one number. That's what we always do to start out with. We boil our research question down to a single number that we can identify um, and think about and hypothesize about and stuff like that. And then number two, that number, the sampling distribution. What is the sampling distribution? And you, we usually need to know things like what's the mean of that distribution and what's its standard deviation. And so with that sampling distribution, we want to know the standard error. The sampling distribution will always have something that's like a, vari a variability type thing. So with t-tests, it's, it's the sampling, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is the standard error. And then finally, we find uh, confidence interval or a p-value and both of those are using the the standard error of the sampling distribution to do that that's how that's how that works all right so let's talk briefly about one of these types of situations here so we've got a single sample t-test the single sample t-test you have you know a bunch of individuals and they each get something measured. Let's call it X. So let's say a bunch of people and they each have a, a body temperature. Maybe it's about coronavirus because I can't stop thinking about anything except coronavirus probably like everybody else in the entire world right now. So everybody has, sorry, that's probably kind of loud. Everybody has a body temperature. So you measure everybody's body temperature and then you think to yourself, okay, so how can I boil this down to one number? Well, we take the mean of that body temperature. So we take the mean of everybody's body temperature, right? And then we think to ourselves, what is the sampling distribution of, all, of the means? And that always involves some assumptions, like you do a thought experiment. You think, what if this mean and these people represented the entire population? Because it's all about trying to guess what's in the population. What if this represented the entire population? Then what would the distribution of all the means I could get if I randomly sampled over and over again with this same sample size? What's the distribution of all those means? So then handy dandy thingy here, then this becomes the sampling distribution of the means. So everything in here is a mean, millions of other means going in here all just kind of if we imagine that we sampled over and over and over again and got samples this size over and over again from the same population and we go in here now if we if we want to say okay so our our sample mean let's put it right here then this gives us a confidence interval right so with a sampling distribution we specify the standard error the standard error always has something from the sample plus um, n. n is in there somewhere. Sometimes multiple n's, whatever. The sampling size matters. So for the sam standard deviation of this sampling distribution, it's easy. It's the standard deviation of these guys divided by the square root of n. So the distribution of all the means is increasingly normal and you find out standard error. So you go like 1.96 standard errors this way and 1.96 standard errors this way and these two numbers are a confidence interval. Or if you're doing a hypothesis test, then you specify a null hypothesis value. Like maybe your null hypothesis value is right here and it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And then you put this distribution over the top of that instead. And then you find where does your mean fit in? What is the p-value here and then you previously probably set up some number 
on each side and that area is you know alpha and you do a hypothesis test but you followed this process all along you took the question and you boil it down to one number specify the sampling distribution what's the standard error of that sampling distribution and then you used that information to construct a confidence interval or a p-value so let's see this with an independent samples t-test with an independent samples t-test you have two groups so let's say you have professors who did go to conferences in uh, Seattle in at the end of February this is us this is the and then you have over here professors that went to conferences other other places okay so you have a bunch of professors and you measure their temperatures and then you have a bunch of professors over here and you measure their temperatures and so then you say how can I boil this whole question because our question is probably like do these professors have a different average temperature from this these professors like are these guys running a fever right are these 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 men and women are they running a fever so you come up with a mean here and a mean here and I'll put S and O Seattle and other so mean Seattle mean of other thanks loud motorcycle with no muffler you really help in this whole situation so you put that that information there you got the two means but that's still two numbers we need one number what do we do we subtract so this is our one number let's say Seattle minus other so then we think what's the sampling distribution of that one number that one number is the mean of the Seattle group minus the mean of the other group what something minus something is just one number five minus four is one you know 12 minus one is 11 it's just one number so we have our sampling distribution up here once again and we could say okay let's we find out that the difference here is 2.1 degrees I think the black marker is crapping out I should switch to pink which seems to be the only other one let's hope this one works it's 2.1 degrees here is the difference between these two things so if you put uh, 2.1 degrees here then you're saying this is the sampling distribution of all possible differences between means that becomes one number and that's one thing and then imagining what if we did another sampling uh, you can get the mean of another s sample from Seattle another sample from the other group and that goes in another sample from Seattle minus the other sample from the other group that goes in millions and millions of times every one of these is a difference and you specify either Seattle minus other or other minus Seattle whatever you just clear on it I did Seattle minus other because if Seattle's higher then it's a positive number and that's kind of fun I don't know it doesn't really matter you just have to do it so everything every value in this distribution is a difference between two means right so you do that and you get this number here and this number here you, you, there's a sand standard error of the difference between the means there's a formula for that it's in your textbook it's in um, the video notes as well the video lectures so that that formula gives you the standard error and it's got the standard deviation of this group the standard deviation of this group the n of this group and the n of this group just kind of remixed in a certain way you punch it in your calculator you get one number that's this standard error in other words the standard deviation of this sampling distribution just like for a single sample t but now it's different so you could get a confidence interval there if you find this number here and this number here and you get like 95 percent or 90 percent you use the t we're going to use t now t is like it's like z it's like the normal but just slightly tweaked um, but you interpret it like the same way or you have a hypothesis test type situation and maybe your hypothesis is your null hypothesis says the difference should be zero because if there's no difference between these two things then this minus this will be zero so in that case here, let me make some space here in that case what's going on is you center this distribution over the null hypothesis value which in this case is zero and you say all right my alpha is 0.01 or whatever and so that's a rejection region and that's a rejection region and this right here is half of alpha and this right here is half of alpha right and then you put 
this in here, let's say this is right there. And so that area from there out is P, and then that is alpha, and P is less than alpha. So you reject the null hypothesis and you say, there is a significant difference between these two things. And in fact, the Seattle group has significantly higher average temperature than the other group. So you could go with a confidence interval direct interpretation or, where did I even put the cap for this? What's wrong with me? Or you can go for a hypothesis test approach with this as well. Now, what about a paired samples t-test? So for this, you need one group of participants. Paired samples um, means there really is just one sample. So I think your textbook calls it a t-test for one sample measured twice, which is a very good description. So let's say you just have the Seattle group, but you have them measured before they went to Seattle and then after they went to Seattle. So everybody has an X1 and an X2. Everybody has two measurements. And they're, they're matched up. And the matching is really important. You can't unmatch these or else you can't do your analysis at all. So now you have two groups of numbers, two groups of observations, but only one group of people. That looks like lungs unintentional in the age of COVID-19. Uh, just a minute. But then you proceed pretty much the same way. You do a subtraction between these things. Now there's two ways to actually do this one. You can come up with the mean of this one and the mean of this one and subtract them, like if you're doing it by hand, and then do the same thing, the sampling distribution of the differences between those things, right? Um, or computationally wise, you can, and this is much easier if you're doing this by hand, Computation-wise, you probably still report each of those means, but computation-wise, you take this minus this, and you do difference scores. So this is like x1, and we might call this x2. We would call these d. So this minus this is a difference score. So this person's score here, actually, we'd probably do after minus before. Their after score minus their before score, that's a difference score. This person's after minus that same person's before. So you know, their temperature after Seattle was 103.1 and before Seattle was 99.2, you subtract that. So everybody gets a different score. And then you come up, and then you have a sampling distribution of the differences. It's equivalent to just saying the difference between two means. The mean of the difference is the same as the difference of the means. It works out the same. But if you're calculating by hand, you absolutely do it with the different scores because it's a lot less work, tons less work. You just do this and then you do a one sample T. You just do a single sample t-test on it. So you have these different scores in here. Everything in here is a different score. One person's difference between their after and their before score. And let's say that you find the difference is, you know, x2 minus x1 is like the mean difference. Now, the difference between these means is exactly the same as if you just took the d bar, the the mean of the differences. It'll be the same. So let's say that's like 2.3 degrees. And that'd be the same if you calculate this, it would also be 2.3 degrees. Little details you need to know. But the point is, you boil this down to one number, a different score, or a difference between means. It's conceptually the same as an independent samples t-test, but there's just a shortcut way to do it if you're doing it by hand. But if you're not doing it by hand, who cares? The computer does it. You mean, mean, difference between means, sampling distribution of all possible differences between means, and let's say you find 2.3 degrees and you're like, I want a 99% confidence interval. So you look in your T table and find out, you know, my N here and my N here. And I find out the T and it's like, you know, 2.16 T scores or something standard error. So 2.16 times the standard error down here and 2.16 times the standard here. You have a confidence interval. Or again, maybe the null hypothesis is zero the null hypothesis is that the true mean should be zero. And so that's mu zero, in other words. And so you don't do your confidence interval. You center your distribution over this, same standard error, everything. And you just work out, you know, your P and your alpha. You know, you compare P to alpha and see which one's bigger. And if P is less than alpha, then you reject the null hypothesis. 
So this is how the t-tests all work together. ANOVA is a little bit different. ANOVA is weird. ANOVA is beautiful and elegant and really annoying. So with analysis of variance, let's say you have three groups of people. People went who went to Seattle for a conference, three individual groups of people. You can do an ANOVA with three groups of observations from the same people, but we're not going to do it in this class. And then you have people who went to St. Louis, and then people who went to New York City all at the same time. And you know that these two had outbreaks of COVID-19 at the time. St. Louis wasn't reported to. So you have some people here and some people here, a bunch of, and they each have a temperature. Each of these X's is a temperature, body temperature. And you, so you get a mean here and a mean here and a mean here, right? So this is like Seattle and then St. Louis and then New York. And so with analysis of variance, what you're trying to figure out is differences between multiple means. So step one is just boil it down into one number. Well, how we do that with analysis of variance is really weird. And so, but it is elegant and beautiful. It works extremely well, but you have to shift your brain. You have to say, okay, what's the variance here and the variance here and the variance here? And let's average those together and that's like the average within group variance. So how different are the Seattle temperatures from each other? Get a calculated variance for that. How different are the St. Louis temperatures from each other? And how different are the New York City temperatures from each other? And you get, now I'm not gonna rehash what's in the videos. The videos I think do a good job of explaining this. And if not, please ask me because I will help. Well, you get this average within groups variance and then you say, what's the variance between the group means? You pretend like each of these, and this is the beautiful flip that Sir Ronald Fisher figured out like in the early 20th century. What's the average, what's the difference between these means, uh, the average difference between them? What's the variance between these means? Like standard deviation, but squared. I mean, think of it as standard deviation if you want, but in the calculations, it's variance, which is the squared version of that. And so then, we just compare those to each other. And if there's a really big difference with between bigger than within, then that means the difference between our means is bigger than we would expect if the only thing that was going on was just random variation, which is what we see within the groups. And so then we've, with our ANOVA table, we have like source and there's some number uh, like within, oh, sorry. Yeah, between and within, and you have sum of squares, and degrees of freedom, mean square, and then F. Okay, this is just a really old fashioned way that we've never gotten rid of, of calculating two variances and then comparing them. So this mean square between is just this right here. It's the variance between groups. And mean square within, mean square is just, an old term that means variance. It's the mean of the squared deviations, etc. So the within groups average, the within, uh, sorry, the within groups, the average of the within groups variance is the is mean square within. You work out the sum of squares and degrees of freedom, sum of squares, degree of freedom. If you're doing things by hand, you calculate each of these things by hand. You divide this by this and it gives you this, this divided by this gives you this, and then this divided by this, it's basically just a fraction. This divided by this gives you an F. And then you have one number. Finally, with analysis of variance, you're down to one number. So once you boil everything in analysis of variance down to one number, that number, this number in analysis of variance is the variance between the group means divided by the variance with the average variance within the groups. It's a complicated thing to say. It's, it makes sense if you think about it enough. You're like, okay, how much bigger is the spread between the groups compared to the spread within the groups? We want a big spread between the groups, not much spread within the groups. And then we can reject the null hypothesis. And so then your sampling distribution is this weird thing. It's F. F just is 
they named it F for Sir Ronald Fisher because he said we should divide this. So it's the sampling distribution of this, the sampling distribution of the ratio between between groups and within groups variance. And so it's crazy. You can't have that negative. I mean, these are both positive. I mean, it can be less than one. I mean, one is like here somewhere and zero is the lowest it can be. And so then you find out if the null hypothesis was true, then where's the point where it would be like, you know, if alpha equals 0 0.05, where's the point which F, F critical, and you look this up in your table, where's the point where 5% or fewer of random samples from the population, like you imagine taking millions and millions of random samples from here and here and here, and then doing this whole calculation and coming up with this divided by this and making it into one number and that number goes in here. So you do that millions of times and the bigger the number here, the more spread out these groups were from each other and the more confident we are that there are differences between the groups. And so you have an F critical uh, and you let, get that by looking up alpha, uh, your alpha value in the F table as well as your uh, degree these degrees of freedom and these degrees of freedom. And then you uh, calculate your F observed and if, and this is the rejection region. If your F observed falls in here, then you reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is always, there is no difference between the groups in the population. And so you say, yeah, there is a difference. We believe there's a difference. But if your F observed falls over here, then you know, you're not in the rejection region. You say, no, these are pretty similar. So we believe that the groups are not spread out enough to make us believe that there's something spreading them out. So there isn't any average difference in temperature between professors who went to Seattle, those who went to St. Louis, and those who went to New York. And you do not reject the null hypothesis. And you say, there's no evidence that those things are different. So questions so far? There are no questions, OK. All right, I'm going to stop this and, you know, make a special treat for me.